Good morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Anwar Bukhars, and I'm a professor of counterterrorism and counterviolent extremism here at the Africa Center uh, for Strategic Studies. And I want to extend a very uh, warm welcome uh, to the many um, Africa Center alumni, distinguished colleagues, you know, friends who have joined us today for this, for this webinar. Uh, on lessons learned from CVE in the Lake Chad Basin. Now, um, I'd like to uh, pass it over to our director, uh, Amanda Dory, to say a few words about the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Bukars. And good day. Bonjour. Bon dia. Assalamu alaikum. Siku nzuri. Dumela, to all of our dear alumni, we're delighted to have you with us this morning. This is our second webinar of 2023, so we feel like the new year is, is still just getting started. It's really a pleasure to greet you from the Africa Center here on the National Defense University campus in Washington, D.C. As mentioned, my name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as the Africa Center's director we're delighted today to be joined by an outstanding panel to discuss violent extremism in the Lake Chad Basin and the latest developments there with participation by our alumni from more than 50 countries this morning in terms of registrations. So clearly a topic of tremendous concern and, and interest. As all of you know, we've been in business now for about 20 years, more than 20 years, chartered by the U.S. Congress to conduct academic programs and research related to security challenges in Africa. Our vision is security for all Africans that's championed by effective institutions that are accountable to their citizens. And as you know, our methodology is to do this work through dialogue and peer learning and looking to catalyze strategic solutions through these types of academic programs. Before I turn it back over to Dr. Bukars, just to remind that our website continues to publish research on a weekly basis. We have new publications coming out all the time. That's www.africacenter.org. Some of our newest offerings include pieces on migration trends, cybersecurity, climate and biodiversity, and a piece that evolved from an event that we hosted on the margins of the US Africa Leaders Summit back in December, a piece that's focused on military professionalism and professional military education. So please do check out the, the website and give us feedback as, as you have the opportunity. With that, let me turn it back over to Dr. Bukars to lead us forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Amen. Uh, now let's begin our session on, uh, on lessons learned from CVE in the Lake Chad Basin. On October, last year, October 13, um, 2022, we convened a webinar that, um, that explored the evolving trajectory of violent extremism in the Lake Chad Basin to try to better understand and this continuous threat uh, it poses in the region, and then try to figure out the way forward for a response. And we had three distinguished panelists that helped us um, to gain a better understanding of the reconfiguration of violent extremist forces uh, on the Lake Chad Basin. And their analysis in that webinar that is on our available on our website, you know, provided, I think, good insights into the composition, to the motivations, the objectives, as well as the inner workings and enabling factors of the most powerful faction of violent extremist groups in the Lake Chad Basin, particularly the so-called Islamic State, um, West Africa uh, province, ISWA. And I think the panelists in that webinar, you know, brought clarity also to the political economy of violent extremism uh, in the Lake Chad Basin and the implications for stabilization response. In this webinar today, you know, we will, or the panelists will provide, I think, analysis of the different approaches, the different strategies to dealing with violent extremism and its impact in the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, as you all know, governments have tried to confront this challenge. Uh, 
uh, by several means. I mean, they have imposed states of emergency, they have supported vigilante networks, uh, they have launched economic projects, among many other initiatives. They have also invested in bolstering their surveillance, their airborne reconnaissance capacity. They have tried to improve coordination between their air and ground forces. At beyond these strategic efforts to upgrade you know, their military, states have also established programs to integrate you know, defectors into society. Uh, at the regional level, as we will hear today, the transnational nature of the threat posed by Boko Haram and its splinter factions has also pushed you know, countries of the Lake Chad Basin to try to enhance their collaboration uh, through several initiatives. One of them is the multinational joint task force. And the mandate of the force has been to blunt this asymmetrical you know, advantage uh, of violent extremist organizations, trying to dislodge them from their strongholds. You know, uh, the force tried to foster the restoration of state authority. And the MNJTF, as we'll hear, has accomplished some of its goals, but you know, this disjointed planning, uh, funding issues have hampered its effectiveness in trying to reclaim uh, violent extremist held territory, trying to stabilize those areas and then to deliver the necessary uh, services to the affected populations. Beyond military engagement, uh, you know, member states adopted, as we will hear today, you know, the regional stabilization recovery resilience strategy for areas affected by Boko Haram in the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, and notably, the strategy, you know, created an important political platform, I think, for civil military cooperation, whereby, you know, the governors of affected territories in the Lake Chad Basin meet with the MNJTF, Lake Chad Basin Commission, and other stakeholders to try to ensure alignment between uh, military operations, political initiatives, and development initiatives. Because that's what, what what's missing here. And there are other pillars, as we will hear, to this to this strategy. So to further unpack all of this, we have with us today three distinguished panels who will analyze the different approaches you know, to dealing with, with violent extremism uh, and its impact in the Lake Chad Basin. We have uh, Dr. Vincent Boucher. Uh, he holds a PhD in political science from the School of Oriental and African Studies. And he's a National Center for Science Research uh, Fellow at the research unit, uh, Les Afriques dans le Monde, Sciences Po Bordeaux in France. And he has done uh, a lot of research on, you know, several theaters, the separatist insurgency in the Casamance, worked on Southern Senegal, uh, et cetera. And since 2016, he has joined the, or he has been researching, you know, violent extremist insurgencies in the Lake Chad Basin, first as a senior analyst and then as a consultant with the International Crisis Group. Uh, we also have with us, you know, Teriola. Um, Tayo. She's police policy advisor uh, with a focus on security, trade, and development issues in, in Nigeria uh, and Africa. And her research interests cover stabilization, peace, and security, uh, as well as trade, policy, and inequality. Uh, practically speaking, she works on the economic dimensions of conflict situations, such as the Boko Haram crisis, uh, as well as on regional integration issues in Africa. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Dr. Chika Charles um, Anikwe. Uh, he's a uh, well-recognized uh, uh, international development expert. He has over 17 years of experience. And he's currently the senior advisor and head of stabilization uh, for the UNDP LCBC Lake Chad Basin Regional Stabilization Strategy. Uh, so Chika Charles holds a PhD and a master's degree in international development from the University of Bradford, and he has a bachelor of political science from the Enugu State University of Science and Technology. So let's start the conversation, and I and I will start with um, uh, Dr. Vincent Fouché. So Vincent, what what are the main trends, uh, actors? 
and drivers of, of conflict in the lake chat basin. So we'll have seven to 10 minutes to address this question. Uh, thanks very much, Anwar, and, and good day to all, uh, whichever time zone you're in. <laughs> um, thanks for the, the occasion. I'm actually glad to be back at the ACSS where I actually was um, invited uh, about 20 years ago. Um, so it's it's good to be to be back in. I always find a lot of uh, of pleasure to this um, mixed crowd um, that uh, that the ACSS is able to gather. It's always very very interesting. So I'm expecting a lot from the discussion. Um, so yeah, let's begin with the drivers. Well, not unexpectedly, I'm afraid uh, it's a mix of uh, of global and local factors, and and clearly there's a global factor there. Uh, fundamentally, I think jihadism is is the Marxism of today. It's the ideology of those who are um, so displeased with the way the world is going uh, that they are looking for um, a vehicle for radical change. And I think interviewed a lot of, um, of, of uh, Boko Haram associates, but defectors uh, over the years, um, especially if you talk to the what they call the pioneers, so the, the early members, it's very clear to them that it was about making the world a better place, um, that, you know, this bringing the Sharia back in, in a way, was about, was about bringing justice into the world. But what did that actually mean locally? What was the injustice um, that they were um, you know, angry about? And, and to me, there's something very, there was something, or there's, there is still something very Nigerian about it. A very strong, stand, a strong sense, and, and quite a few Nigerians share that in different ways in different parts of Nigeria and express it in different languages, political languages, a very strong sense that the state is not really theirs. Um, and, and as you know, Nigeria, in Nigeria, there's a very lively debate between this, this sense of um, a, a Christian South and a Northern uh, and Muslim North. And it it's, doesn't quite work like that, of course, because there are lots of autochthonous uh, Christians in the North and autochthonous Muslims in the South. But still, you know, there is this perception there, this concern, this worry, uh, that's in each com that is very present in each community that the state is not working to their benefit essentially that it's favoring the others and uh, and i think it really fed into uh, the development of uh, of boko haram and th but there's a specific angle as well something um, something having to do with the north um, a bit more um, which i think boko haram is very much the expression of the anger of um, of the people of the market versus the people of the state, if you want to, to, to phrase it like that. Um, a sense of estrangement that a lot of the people working in the urban informal economy feel um, in relation to the state and the state elites. The state and its elites are seen as abusive and responsive. Uh, remember Nigeria was a military dictatorship until you know, fairly recently. Um, a, a command state, um, a state in which the security forces operated uh, with, with, a, with a culture of impunity and brutality. Um, and so this sense that there's this state that's brutal and wealthy and, and we are being mistreated and, and you know, we're not re being responded to, I think that that really fed uh, fundamentally the anger that, uh, that created Boko Haram. If you look at the name Boko Haram itself, you know, Boko Haram, it's Western education is forbidden. But actually, I think Boko, uh, Western education, it's a sort of stand-in for, for the state, you know, they, because... Western education is the sort of symbol and origin of statehood, essentially, in Nigeria. So that's the recipe. Uh, now to the actors. Um, so we have a movement, a GID movement that is divided with a, with a debate, well, actually a, a conflict, an internal conflict, uh, over the models of jihad. And I'll get back to that a bit if I have enough time. Um, and then we have a coalition of states, uh, the four Lake Chad states, that have come together over time um, and that are, you know, have, have being able to hold the ground, but they still very much struggle to win this. And then the sort of larger, uh, larger scale, you've got um, a lot of interest and support on the part of, of the UK, the US, uh, the EU, France, and, and a number of international actors, though it remains actually quite limited compared to what we saw, what we used to see uh, in neighboring Mali, for instance. Uh, but actually, I would argue maybe it's not such a bad thing in a sense, uh, given how Mali is turning out. At least in a way, uh, in the Lake Chad states, uh, there is ownership to the crisis. The crisis, crisis is, is owned uh, by the states, uh, local states. And I, I believe that it is actually quite a good thing, even though it doesn't come without problems. So 
maybe let me take the like three minutes I have left <laughs> to discuss a bit more um, the, the 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 state of the of the GID movements right now. So we have essentially two: um, Jas uh, Jamaat Halal Sunnah Lidawati Wal Jihad, so the original Boko Haram, if you want, um, and the Islamic State West Africa province that Anwar uh, already mentioned. Um, there's Ansaru, uh, but another sort of Al Qaeda connected movements, uh, but but. It, I, I mean, I think they've been losing steam for a long time, and I, I don't quite see them as very significant these days. And, and what we really need to understand is the very stark contrast in the models uh, that JAS and ISWAP operate with. Um, ISWAP broke away from JAS's leader, um, Abu Bakr Shekau, in 2016. It was then the underdog. You know, nobody really took them seriously. But then they've implemented what I call the rationalization of jihad. Uh, they've they've um, established a more bureaucratic organization with a lot more internal control over the behavior of fighters. Uh, there's a very collective leadership as opposed to the very individualistic, um, charismatic um, Shekau style leadership. They have nurtured carefully a fiscal base. Uh, they have received support and advice and some money uh, from the Islamic State. And, and because of that, um, they, they've, they've really you know, gained um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of strength. It might not show so much today, especially because of the buildup in the Nigerian Air Force these last years. Uh, they are not able to get away with the big attacks that they were doing in 2018, 2019, but they are still extremely active. Um, and they are essentially a guerrilla organization. They are adapting their MO, um, and they have a very sustained presence in rural areas. They've got you know, lots of small patrols. A few guys on a bike is enough to control you know, quite, quite a, a substantial chunk of, of land. And the army... It makes it difficult for the army to challenge that kind of, uh, of very, very light uh, control. They're even able to uh, infiltrate killers into state-controlled towns. They've been doing that quite a bit um, this, last, um, this last year. Uh, and it's quite a big challenge uh, because of that. Um, and then there's Jazz, the original uh, Boko Haram. Um, and it's a very different configuration. It's a mix of sectarianism, you know, this sense that we are better than the others, we are the real Muslims and the others, they just don't count. And we, we, we can, you know, kill them, plunder them, enslave them at will. Um, so it's a mix of sectarianism and plunder. You can, you can capture, you can raid, um, and it's no problem. And, and fundamentally, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't, you don't have to be another price to realize that it's a losing game in the sense that there's only so much you can plunder. At some point, you know, all the economic networks will have moved away from you. Um, there's nothing left. So wh what they did is essentially they went on the defensive. They created this sort of enclave in the Sambisa forest that they were able to defend. And, and they were still launching those small survival raids outside to try and get some resources. But they were essentially um, lo a losing organization. And in 2021, um, as, as you may know, uh, ISWAP was able to, to push them around and, and force um, Chicago into, into suicide. But I still think um, that it's important to realize that this logic of plunder and sectarianism um, can survive. We are still seeing just fight back. We are still seeing them um, hanging on, especially to, to the like Lake Chad itself, which is particularly well endowed. So in a way, the, the plunder model can, can subsist a bit more there uh, than in the Samisa forest. So um, it's really all in flux uh, between those two groups right now. There's, there's quite a bit of fighting, but there's also quite a bit of talking. There's a mediation uh, by, by um, a variety of, uh, of religious uh, figures and by the Islamic State as well. So it could really go in various ways. And I, I think the way this goes is going to have a huge impact on, on, on you know, the way the insurgency um, keeps affecting or not uh, the Northeast. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Vincent. We talked about this crisis of marginalization and, and neglect, and, and then you delved into this fractured landscape of violent extremism. I think you draw a, a nice contrast there of models, as you said, between these two organizations, ISWAP and, and GAS or JAS, Boko Haram. Uh, the how the ISWAP, you know, has rationalized, as you said, violent extremism here. There's bureaucratic management. Uh, uh, fiscal base, uh, 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 etc., versus Boko Haram, this mix of sectarianism as, as plunder, um, as 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 you put it. Um, so that's all. Let's go to the second question, uh, if we may. And how does this conflict uh, impact regional security? 
uh, and also the domestic stability of the four countries of the Lake Chad Basin. So the conflict impacts a lot the people on the ground. I mean, the humanitarian cost has been immense. Uh, you know, millions of people displaced, um, hundreds of thousands probably now actually killed. Um, I think the estimate that's floating around is way too small. Uh, if you if you mix all forms of violence, including the repression by the state, which has not always been very light touched. Um, but the thing is, Boko Haram operates so far on, on what is for all the Lake Chad countries, a geographical margin. Um, it's a corner, it's enclaved for all four countries. Actually, the Lake Chad, the, the, the region du Lake Chad for Chad is, is quite close to N'Djamena, but still in a way it's enclaved. It's quite remote, removed from the from the politics of Jamena, uh, those are minority groups uh, that live there who do not have, you know, a substantial resonance at the at the national level in Chad. And and you could make the same reasoning for for all for all those countries. Maybe in Niger is it's slightly less of a margin uh, than for the others. Um, and I say this because at the very same time, all those countries also have other uh, security challenges to face, um, and some of them which may seem to them more pressing, more threatening, um, even though I, I do think that there's a very real threat uh, and a very real potential um, in, in Boko Haram. So I think it's one of the problems is that this has made it very difficult for the states to muster the resources and the, and, and the attention span um, in, in, you know, in, that is necessary to address, uh, to address this crisis. Um, one thing that has helped, though, is the fact that Nigeria is a federation, and, and so the governor, uh, the governor of Borno, who is an elected official, uh, has a lot of as an independent budget and has a lot of uh, of legitimacy, and and the you know the governors have actually been uh, very active in trying to uh, to move the game. Uh, we might not always agree with with the way in the directions they've taken, but you know there's a degree of commitment and, and interest and attention. I think that has been quite. Quite remarkable, and is is you know one reason for optimism certainly. Um, so there is this history of, of of marginality. There's also a history of diffidence between these four states. Um, you know, Nigeria and Cameroon were were um, in a in a sort of small scale local conflict in the Bakasi Peninsula. Uh, you know, thirty years ago, twenty years ago. Um, but interestingly, I think, and it's again, it's another positive. I think this has largely been overcome. And, and, and there's still all sorts of you know, crazy conspiracy theories that are floating around, but I, I, I have a very strong sense that all Lake Chad states realize that they're in this together, they need to, they need to work things out together. Um, collaboration is not perfect, of course, but I think it has really improved uh, substantially. And I, I, I think, I mean, if you want to look at the different ways in which it, it affects those, those, those different states, to me, again, it's a very Nigerian issue. Uh, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon are affected. Um, and they are affected by business. Uh, Boko Haram is buying and selling, uh, and also by raiding. There's quite a bit of, of raiding by either uh, of, of the organizations in those, in those territories. Uh, they used to be used for recruitment, uh, and a number of, of young people, especially from Cameroon and Niger, actually joined uh, Boko Haram, uh, sometimes for, for money. Um, but people have realized that enlisting was not such a good idea after all, and I, I think that uh, that trend is by and large dead, the recruitment um, outside of, uh, of Nigeria, uh, which again is, is another good uh, symptom. Um, but there, are sti there still is quite a bit of cross-border activities, quite a bit of business going on. Um, and for all that, uh, I think it, the fundamental thing is that Nigeria is really the main target of the movement, the, the, the thing they are, that they're looking at. Um, and it's even more so because for a long time the conflict used to be uh, contained in the northeast. Um, after a moment when it had a larger impact as far in northern Nigeria, but well, actually we, since tw early 2022, we've seen a few attacks by ISWAP outside of the northeast, uh, in Kogi State, uh, in Ondo State, uh, which is even more surprising, and even in Abuja itself. Uh, you may have heard about the prison that was attacked and a number of, um, of jihadi uh, detainees that were freed. Uh, on that occasion. Um, and all this happens in the context of a broader expansion of jihad in West Africa, uh, with a very strong competition between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State to, um, to plant flags uh, around, you know, Benin, Northern Benin, Northern Ghana, Northern Ivory Coast, 
um, are interesting areas these days. And I, what I'm hearing from interviews is that ISWAP uh, may well have a special role there for the Islamic State because it has been the most successful branch of the Islamic State um, these last few years, um, like even on a global scale. You know, if you look at Al Naba, uh, the periodical of, um, of the Islamic State, um, ISWAP has made the covers more than any other uh, faction, um, any other province uh, of the Islamic State. Uh, there's even information now that one of, a key official of ISWAP, uh, Habib Yusuf, um, has, gained, has been given by the IS a sort of leading role as a sort of you know, watch, watcher uh, for the whole of Pan-African Jihad uh, because his handling of the organization has been, has been so successful. So there's a debate about this. I mean, what is this expansion about? Is it in a way compensatory uh, because it's more difficult to f for them to fight in Borno and they're trying to, to you know, extend, hit elsewhere, uh, softer targets, targets that are less prepared? Um, or is, is there a deeper dynamic at play? You know, uh, there's been a sustained uh, long-term development of capacity in other areas, you know, careful investments, and now progressively they, progressively they are activating these. Um, I'm afraid that's a question to you as well as to me, and uh, you know I, I, I leave us uh, with this question now. Absolutely, thank you, and I'm sure we'll uh, we'll come back to uh, to it, and, and the other panelists uh, will touch on on that as 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 well. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn to um, to um, to uh, Tignola. Um, uh, you know the 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 results in you know this insurgency. I mean, it's still as as, as Vassal said, Nigerian for for the most part, but it has you know displaced I mean, uh, more than two million people. It has aggravated the loss of livelihoods. Uh, uh, it has led to uh, the emergence of a severe uh, humanitarian crisis. You know among uh, among other consequences here. Uh, so if you can discuss for us, and you have authored, uh, co-authored an excellent piece uh, uh, on the socioeconomic uh, aspects of this conflict, and if you can describe the economic actors in the region, uh, how they have been affected by this conflict, um, and also, you know, how some government measures, you know, they have exacerbated uh, this, uh, this vulnerability. Tineola? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Pleasure, so of course. I said, um, my intervention is going to focus mainly on the empirical studies that we carried out at that time with the Institute for Security Studies. We went to the Lake Chad Basin and we spoke to traders and transporters and asked them how they had been surviving even under the shadows of Boko Haram. But first of all, I think that we need a framework for examining these issues. When you talk about the socioeconomic perspective to the conflict, um, it's widely studied, but I don't think it's studied as much as the conflict dynamics itself. Uh, I like to say that the conflict dynamics are more sexy or they're sexier than um, the livelihood question. But then you have the factors that contributed to the emergence of the conflict, which um, Dr. Fouché has spoken about a little bit. But then you also have the impacts on livelihoods that Boko Haram themselves have had. And of course, you have the dimension of how the socioeconomic perspective can play a part in finding sustainable solutions to the conflict. I'll focus on the second and the third. So the impacts of the conflict on livelihoods, but also a bit on how thinking about these issues can help us better address the conflicts, just a bit on that. And first of all, I think, you know, when we say livelihoods, how should we think about livelihoods? I think you can think about it in a couple of ways. So there's the issue of production, you know, then there's the issue of consumption, there's the issue of exchange, there's distribution, and then you have jobs. Boko Haram has affected livelihoods in, in many ways. You have the direct impact of the Boko Haram violence on livelihoods. Uh, on consum on production, for example, you have the access to farmlands and to fishing grounds that were cut off. The Lake Chad Basin was historically an agrarian you know, economy. Um, it was about farming, but also about exchange because there's a lot of trading going on across the region between the between the re between the different micro regions in the LCB. So going across even nation states 
um, like I think also has been mentioned. So there was cut off of access to farmlands, there was a cut off of access to fishing grounds, and just these things that played a big part in, in some of the production economies. So that was one of the main ways that, um, that the, I mean, that economic actors were affected by the conflict. Then you move to consumption. How was consumption affected? Don't forget that even when you produce, you know, you don't produce for just yourself, except maybe you're producing at a subsistence level, you're producing for a market. And the conflict meant that the market size in the region reduced, you know, so um, even if you could still produce, you didn't have as much of a market to sell to people could not buy as much because I mean, obviously their population was reduced because of of the debts and then a lot of people were displaced so you know the, the consumption was affected and that also affected um, the economies in the region exchange was a big part of, of of things i mentioned markets just now and markets themselves were destroyed by the by the book Haram, by the violent extremists so the dis destruction of markets not only affected the ability to exchange goods but also it affected the credit of traders because um, what we heard from a lot of actors and people told me this directly that for example, when they would buy goods, usually they would buy goods on credit and then store them in their shops. But when the market was burnt down, it meant that their stock was also burnt down. So they found themselves in debt, for uh, uh, you know, as one thing, but also they found themselves losing access to their operational capital. So it meant they could not operate at the same levels as they used to before, because a lot of their stock, you know, where their assets were invested had been destroyed. Linked to exchanges distribution and the transport sector was really affected by Boko Haram. There is an article by a former colleague, Rimaji, and um, this focused on over sea transport, so transport by water, not sea, by the lake, where canoists, those that ride the canoes, and also those that own the canoes were affected by the crisis because those waters were now so dangerous that they couldn't move goods um, via water. We all know about the problems with overland transport. So you had the closure of some transport routes by government measures, which I'll touch on um, in just a bit. But also you had the fact that a lot of transport routes were now very dangerous. So the risk of taking these routes were too high for some traders and transporters to, to go across those routes. And what it meant was that they had to take longer routes that were, I mean, there was a higher cost in terms of time and even in terms of monetary cost of taking those routes. Also related to transports was um, what some people reported, which was um, extortion, you know, along even the longer routes. And those costs were often transferred to the price of goods, which again um, affected the market potential for their goods because these goods were more expensive. Uh, transporters also faced issues because they were often accused of being part of Boko Haram. So it's been between a rock and a hard place in that sense where even when you risk trying to go across those routes, you um yeah you also are you're vulnerable to either being attacked by Boko Haram or being seen as someone that's maybe doing uh, one or two things for Boko Haram. So that was one of the one of the issues. And then you move to jobs. I think that this is um, an aspect that is not thought about even as much because when you think about livelihoods in the region, yes, um, it was a lot of smallholder farmers, a lot of you know the smaller scale production, but the Lake Chad Basin includes some large cities, especially when you think about the Nigerian states, the Borno Adamawa Yubi. And you had some large firms in these places, uh, some micro, medium to large firms that just left the region. So we're, we're told by um, some respondents that when the crisis began to get more serious, there was more or less an outward migration of some economic actors to other areas like Kano states or Kaduna states that were deemed to be safer. And when they took away their operations, they were not only taking away the goods or services that they provided, but also the jobs um, that they were providing um, for people in the region. So leading to the increase in unemployment and leading to the reduction in the options or the opportunities that were available for, for economic actors in the region. Uh, very quickly, um, I want to also touch on the government's measures that affected the crisis, you know, like you asked. And the thing is, I mean, yes, I think uh, Dr. Fisher also spoke about this, or Vincent also mentioned this a bit, but then two things, there was a banning of the production and exchange of some goods. Um, you know, and this was done with the intent of trying to disrupt Boko Haram's attempts to take over local economies, where Boko Haram began to participate in the production of some of these goods and to make money to raise funds from from selling these goods, but also. Um, 
it was one way to try to prevent the other activities of Boko Haram. So for example, you had some goods that were being used to make bombs, you know, like fertilizers. And these measures were, you know, taken with those intents to stop Boko Haram from making money from these um, economies, but also to affect Boko Haram's operations in terms of the violence that they were, that they were wrecking on the region. But of course, it affected economic actors because, uh, the, I mean, the market size for goods such as um, Pepe at that time, even fish greatly reduced. And in the reports that you mentioned, we have the numbers there. Even things like the movement of cattle or the cattle markets in the region was also greatly affected. It's reduced um, by a significant amount. And so you have banning on one side. The second side is the transport, the booking of transport routes. Again, this was done to try to limit the movement of the violent extremists al al along the region. The establishment of security checkpoints along those routes would also, you know, to also monitor the movements in the region, but it affected economic actors. So I also I already mentioned the extortion of economic actors by sometimes security officials, but then also just the fact that the closure of routes you know, meant that people had to take longer routes that were more expensive, that took more time, and that meant that they had to change the way they were trading. Um, to wrap up uh, this particular intervention, I'd like to talk about women. So women were affected by the crisis uh, in many similar ways um, as their male counterparts, but they were at higher risk of a different kind of violence, which is sexual violence um, in, 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 in many regards. So it meant that, for example, when a transport route was deemed to be very dangerous, um, they were less able to risk going across those routes because, you know, apart from being, uh, I mean, they were exposed to maybe being kidnapped um, by the violent extremists, being, and we know the stories of, of, of the roles that women are often made to play um, within the extremist groups. So they were affected in these ways. And this was despite the fact that a lot of households in the region were now women-led or single-income women-led households where the children were very dependent on the livelihoods of the mothers. But we had women that reported that they had to reduce the scale of their production um, from maybe they were large-scale wholesale traders. They had to become retail um, traders, you know, just to find one way to survive or the other. And of course, you have the generalized impact of the crisis in terms of um, the death uh, of, of people in the region, the displacement of people in the region, and just the fact that everything was disrupted uh, to a large extent. Absolutely. Very good. Uh, I, I liked how you dwelled on what livelihoods is and went to the production, the consumption, the distribution uh, uh, part of it. I also touched on state counterinsurgency responses and how they have distorted production transportation uh, and uh, and trade and trade bans of commodities uh but they would that was done because it was perceived to be of value obviously to um um to, to Boko Haram uh, but there was also abuse of power there was also uh, extortion that unfortunately as, as you wrote in that report has not been offset by the provision of safety to communities uh but communities have been forced to uh, to adopt uh, coping uh, uh strategies and, and you touched uh, uh on, on how on how women have, have have done that so that would be my my second questions uh you know how um have communities uh sustained livelihoods and that and how they have or, or how have they adapted uh to this crisis yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, one thing that has happened, um, and there are many ways of looking at this again, is the perverse social contracts that have been established um, between some communities and some violent extremist groups. So if you think back to, I mean, what does every human being want? They want to be able to eat. They want to be able to maybe feed their families. They just want to be able to do something that brings to themselves some kind of income that means that they can live um, a good life, you know, that's that's the bare minimum. And the conflict meant that even doing this was difficult. So you're a farmer, you just want to go to your farm to farm, produce something so you can exchange for money and then buy the things that you yourself, your family needs. And if you can't do that, then there's nothing else you can do. So you've had communities that have had to go into these contracts with violent extremists where the violent extremists uh, promise safety. Um, for them to just do that bare minimum of going to the farm. And um, I mean, it's not usually very willing, but then this is a situation that they find themselves in. Because the question is, can the government 
um, guarantee their security or is it the violent extremists that can guarantee their security and many times they find themselves realizing that it's the violent extremists. When it comes to the perverse social contracts, is, there's also the issue of the economies of violence. And there's also a great report by the ISS on this, where I like to give the example of maybe um, someone that was producing bread, you know, and selling bread to people in the region. But if you remember, consumption capacity was reduced. So absorption capacity for goods produced were reduced in the region. And then one day on his way somewhere, he gets kidnapped by Boko Haram. And then they tell him, you know, we, we need you to bring 1,000 loaves of bread to us every morning. And we're going to pay you this and this amount. Just don't tell the police, don't tell the military, don't tell anyone. And now this man is um, stuck again between a rock and a hard place because on one side, he's been experiencing declining demand for his bread because there are fewer people in the region. There's less money in the region. And on the other hand, if he starts to supply bread to Boko Haram, he's somehow involved in the conflict, even though he's just selling the product. So he had community members finding themselves being drawn into the economies of violence, and somehow their livelihoods are now tied to um, the resilience of the violent extremists one way or the other, whether it's by supplying goods, supplying fuel, or just doing one or two things for these um, violent extremists. So that's one of the, uh, I mean, the aspects under the perverse social contracts. Of course, you have um, economic actors that change their business activities. So I think I mentioned this already, but you know, just moving from one thing to the other. So perhaps you used to import um, hardware, and then you decide to start importing, you know, consumer goods. Because one thing about people, no matter what you would, there are some basic consumer goods that you'd always need. Um, so there was a trade swapping where people moved from the, you know, trading of one good to the other good. And of course, I said there was also um, the reduction in the scale of activities. So if you used to import large cargoes of, you know, hardware or whatever from one region, maybe textiles from one region, you would instead go into the trading of maybe little things like soap or, you know, things that are needed in the homes that people would always buy on it, even things that um, internet space persons may also also need. So that happened. They had to switch. Um, they had to switch business activities. An interesting aspect of this is also the impact of the NGO economy in the region. It, it was quite fascinating to me because you now had people that were um trying to secure supply to NGOs. So they became vendors, you know, in 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 that sense, where even people were renting out their houses to to NGOs. So just really finding different ways to survive. There's a growing services economy now in the region with the young people. Um, I think the last time I was in I was in Major Guri, I saw that there was someone that had started uh, something similar to Uber, you know. So just trying to explore the digital economy, new options for for earning livelihoods or for earning incomes. So these were some of the strategies for the micro and small businesses. But you also have the large businesses. And there's a piece by the Financial Times that was really good on this. I think I have one also um, with the ISS where firms like Coca-Cola that had their supply chains disrupted by the conflicts found ways to be resilient also by working with communities. So by working with their distributors and their vendors, they're able to reconfigure their supply routes, their supply chains to make sure that they could continue to operate in the region. And this was important because don't forget that this links back to jobs, you know, and the options that are available for young people in the region. And there is actually business in the region. I think one of the articles I wrote showed that even the demand for FMCGs, the consumer goods, is growing as you know recovery efforts are ongoing. The demand for these goods is growing, and um, there's actually um, you know opportunities for business. Although we always say that capital is cowardly, so the the risk for violence and conflict there is still is still high. Um, but these things are happening. To conclude this, because I think I'm almost out of time, I just say that um, there are ways that they can be supported. So one thing that we kept on hearing was that they needed loans. And, you know, these loans, I mean, they weren't asking for free money, but then the loans had to not be too expensive because a lot of these actors had lost their capital or they were already in debt. There were these um, credit facilities, you know, like these unions that they used to have before that were also disrupted. So they were asking for loans from, from the government or from other actors that could let them try to recover um, the level of business that they were that they were um, operating at before the conflict. And then you have reskilling. It's already happening in some, in some ways. But then this would allow people to move from one business activity to the other. You, you need infrastructure as well. And then investments um, that can create more jobs in the regions, you know, even to keep up with, um, we'd say, the modern economy. Um, and then to, even to help people that are already in maybe agriculture um get more value for their goods so yeah let me conclude there thank you thank you uh, 
outlined nicely how how communities have tried to adopt you know coping strategies uh, at certain times as as you noted that included uh, uh, your words here perverse social contracts especially with with violent extremist groups um, and these strategies sometimes they abet uh, criminality and they strengthen that economy of um, of violence uh, but uh, uh, in other instances you know people and businesses have become more creative and, and innovative but they need they need support as you said you know people need loans because uh, they have lost capital they're already indebted uh, more investments is needed infrastructure um, uh, etc so let, let me bring into the discussion now um uh, uh, Dr. Um, Aniqui. So, uh, and here for 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 our participants, uh, I I urge you to type your questions uh, in the Zoom chat so that our panelists can can answer them. So just don't don't wait uh, till uh, till um, till we get to the Q and A uh, session. Uh, so so Chica, I mean, stabilize stabilizing you know, region that is ravaged by conflict is is not an easy thing to do, obviously, uh, particularly when that region, you know, is a, is a hotbed, hot spot, you know, for, um, for, for violence. And in this case, violence perpetrated by, by violent extremist uh, uh, groups. And as you noted yourself in, in one of the author, you, in, in one of the pieces you authored, you know, approximately 10 million people, I think you, you, uh, you mentioned in the Lake Chad region, parts of Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria are directly affected by this crisis. Uh, and close to a quarter of that number, uh, they have been forced to flee their homes uh, due to conflict caused by, by this insurgency. So given your expertise, uh, uh, if you can you know, discuss uh, some of the layers of effort from local, national, you know, regional, and also international actors to try to promote stability uh, and try to ensure, you know, recovery and resilience for the affected uh, population. So, Chika. So, thank, thank you so much, Anwar. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, the question you've posed is a very good uh, segue from the conversation that uh, we've had so far and from uh, what uh, Tiniola and Vincent has presented. And I think also this session is actually very, very timely as uh, I'm currently in Niamey uh, planning for the third Lake Chad Region Conference that's going to be happening um, on the 23rd and 24th uh, next week. In, in, in answering the question, the layers of effort um, uh, in the LCB, I think we have to look at it at you know different levels, and I think you have done a good job of uh, itemizing the different levels. But I think the first starting point to highlight is prior to 2018, the non-military efforts that's been going on in the region has been uh, decentralized to the various countries or the various states: Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. Each of these countries has focused on trying to find ways to rebuild the areas that have been destroyed by Boko Haram and the, the other factions. An example is that Nigeria, for example, established the Northeast Development Commission, NEDC, with the mandate focusing on rehabilitation and rebuilding the Northeast, develop, the Northeast area that's been affected by Boko Haram. But in 2018, I think there's a recognition by the member states of the region, especially the four riparian countries, that the conflict in itself is no more a conflict that is going to be addressed at the national level. It has taken a regional dimension. And they also looked at the fact they have established the Joint Military Tax Force in the name of the MNJTF, which is also taking a, a regional approach there's a need to look at the regional approach in terms of addressing uh, the issue and bringing efforts to rebuild. And they, they developed what we call the Lake Chad Basin Regional Strategy for Stabilization, Recovery, and Resilience. And I think this is going to be the frame upon which I anchor my response to the efforts. And when you look at the strategy, you recognize 
three key things. One is that it has to be regional in nature, but the action has to be local. The second thing that the, the strategy has identified is that it ha cannot be business as usual. Ownership of the process has to rest within the state authority to ensure continuity. The third thing that the, the strategy identified is to ensure there is a nexus between humanitarian, between development, and between peace actors in a way that has a continuum from humanitarian assistance to stabilization to recovery and to longer term development. But when you look at the specificities, the specifics in terms of effort, let's look at the regional level. If you look at the regional level, most of the effort at regional level, within the level of the Lake Basin Commission itself has centered around coordination, around creating the space for the countries to engage and dialogue, but also to be able to agree on practical activities and intervention to be able to rebuild social contracts between the communities and the, 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 the government. And such as one of such uh, platform is what you mentioned, the Governors Forum, which is where the, the Tad Basin brings the eight governors of the eight affected territories together to focus on three key things. One is to look at key interventions that will be implemented Across board, at cross board, at cross border level. Two is to identify key cross border interventions that they can implement. But also three is to share experiences and share best practices, but also agree on key policy issues they can advocate for at the national level. But also the effort at the regional level has also been around how do we ensure that the what national joint tax force complement the effort of stabilization on the ground by trying to support uh, the MNGTF to really uh, understand more its role in terms of civil military cooperation. How do they engage more with the communities on the one side? And secondly, with humanitarian actors on the other side, but I think we're going to deal with that a little bit later. But also at the regional level, what are the key policy initiatives that we need to develop to harmonize the divergences and the differences between the four countries in terms of policies. And I'll just take one example. When you look at the four countries, one of the key area of divergence is around how to rehabilitate and reintegrate the ex Boko Haram associates that are surrendering and coming out. And you look at the history of the four countries that are coming from different areas and angle. So focusing on policy harmonization has been an effort at regional level. Beyond that, at the national level, most efforts are around coordinating interventions at the subnational level. And at the subnational level, effort has been around three key areas. And I'm going to use an example of one of the partners that are supporting the Lecter Basin Commission, uh, which is the UNDP efforts on stabilization through the regional stabilization facility. One is to broadly to restore shift to contract between the communities and the, the, the state authorities at the subnational level. And this effort, this effort has focused on three key areas. One is to rebuild the basic infrastructures and services that Boko Haram has destroyed. And this effort has led to rebuilding of schools, rebuilding of hospitals, police stations, judicial offices, uh, and etc., including rebuilding an entire community. Between 2000 and 21, between 2019 and 2021, UNDP rebuilt 21, uh, what we call joint action plan areas between the government and UNDP. And between 2021 and up to date, they focus on 35 new areas. And these include bringing new infrastructure and rebuilding better. The second area is improving security. Working closely, the government of the four countries at the subnational level the effort has been how to improve security. I think Vincent mentioned the gap of trust between the government and the people in terms of security. So effort has been there in terms of rebuilding security, government presence in those areas. There's been a lot of investment, but also in, in building capacities of security actors to actually understand their role and what is required to secure an area that is that has conflict that is ongoing. So there's been a lot of investment by donors and government in those areas. 
The third area relates to what uh, Tinola mentioned around livelihood. A lot of people have been affected by the action of Boko Haram in terms of disrupting their economic activities. So this effort on land livelihood goes into two areas. One is to support uh, affected households in different communities across the four countries with grants that enable them to start off economic activities. The second is also around cash for work. Some of this cash for work, cash for work, some of these infrastructures that I mentioned in the first instance, instead of rebuilding schools, hospitals, courts, police stations, immigration posts, they ensure that the labor for this infrastructure are coming from those communities. And this is another area of ensuring that people now raise uh, a small capital to go back into farming at the same time that communities are coming back into those communities that have been rebuilt. And the next thing we're going to look at is also what are the other efforts beyond state actors and regional institutions like the MNGTF? You have a lot of efforts from civil society organizations, uh, faith-based organizations engaging in uh, counter-terrorism messaging, uh, trying to work with traditional authorities and religious groups to engage with communities, um, peace building, a lot of peace building activities that are ongoing in the communities through civil society organizations that focus in uh, engaging and building social cohesion between communities. Because one of the things you have to know around the Boko Haram operation is that it has disrupted community social cohesion in a way that um, families that are friends before who become enemies because perhaps uh, your son is a member of Boko Haram and he has killed my daughter. So they have a lot of uh, uh, organizations, a lot of civil societies that are focusing efforts in rebuilding those social cohesion, in bringing a lot of peace building activities on the ground. But also you have a lot of uh, self-help groups that has metamorphosed. I think we can have a lot of questions in terms of their operation, but in terms of also uh, the human rights implications of their work. But specifically for Nigeria, that's what is called the Civilian Joint Tax Force, which is uh, basically a vigilante group. Uh, I think last uh, April, we had a session with uh, Harvard where we focus on the effort of the, uh, the CJTF. And they have become to a very large extent uh, the messiah to some communities. Why to, to a very large extent, some communities see them as a threat to their safety because there's a allegation of, also of uh, extortion. There's allegations of uh, uh, high-handedness. There's allegations of uh, 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 you know, repressor killing, uh, you know, jungle justice, and et cetera. So these are pockets of activities and a uh, bit of effort that are ongoing um, across the different uh, levels. But I think one effort I think is important to highlight is the international uh, effort around the Lake Chart. The unique thing about the Lake Chart, if you look at it compared to other regions that are facing similar situation, is the Lake Chart Basin region is the only region that the strategy as an overarching framework is owned by the member states and the international organization, the Lake Chart Basin Commission. If you look in the Briga Sahel, we have the UN strategy for the Sahel. If you look at ICGRR, you have the UN strategy for the, for the Great Lakes uh, and etc. But in the Lake Chad, you do not have the UN strategy for the Lake Chad. You have the Lake Chad Basin strategy for itself that has formed what Vincent said initially, said ownership that allowed the member states and the, the Lake Chad Basin Commission and the communities to own the process and to bring different partners. So the effort of international community has been very much around coalescing and supporting the member states and the LCBC to mobilize both resources, both political supports, but also for advocacy for, to ensure that the strategy becomes the entry point and the rallying point of support. I think I'm going to stop there for now uh, uh, and uh, over to you, Anwar. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, very good. It, you know how you, uh, you know, talked about this this whole of 
uh, society approach here that tries to connect, you know, regional challenges, uh, you know, with the with regional uh, solutions. But at the same time, you are bringing communities at the center of the of uh, of, of of the solution here. And and you mentioned that example of the governors uh, forum, which provides you know this framework for regional you know cross border cooperation which is essential obviously to tackle the the lake chad uh, crisis again uh, uh, all the all of you uh, have emphasized that, that the, 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 the you know the the ownership part of it uh, also which is which is critical so that takes me to the to the second question if you can also uh, I'll ask two two questions that complement each other first if you can uh, you know, delve a little bit deeper into, you know, what is the Lake Chad Basin Commission, uh, some of these interventions, and also if you can touch on on that, you know, practicalities, peculiarities of civil military engagements, because you uh, that that came up in 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 your intervention, and and that's a key key point here. So, no, thank you, Anwar. Um, when you talk about the Lake Chad Basin Commission. Um, uh, it's, an, it's an institution that comprises uh, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, Cameroon, uh, uh, Central African Republic, uh -huh. uh, and uh, Egypt, uh, and uh, Libya being a, 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 an observer. Now, but when you talk about the riparian countries, the focus now turns to Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria. And uh, it was established in 1964. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it was established, the focus has mainly been around management of water and environmental issues. Of course, the mandate touches on regional integration. But this effort uh, uh, before the emergence of Boko Haram has been mostly around managing crisis around the water and how the member states will manage the water. So from uh, 2015 onwards, it begin to build its capacity or develop its capacity around regional integration and managing conflict in the region. So uh, most of the uh, engagement of the Lake Basin Commission at the moment has been mostly around managing and trying to improve the hydraulic capacity of the lake. As you know, uh, there's argument on the one side that the lake uh, is shrinking. Uh, there's also the other argument that it shrank up to, to 1990s and it's coming back again. Mm -hmm. So I do not want to get into that argument. Uh, we can do that argument when we talk about the water and environmental issues. But on the other side, uh, it's also focusing on trying to manage uh, the coordination of the implementation of the strategy itself, because it's the lecture business strategy and building partnership around uh, uh, the strategy at both international, at both uh, regional, but also national and subnational level. And this is how it's been able to do this, creating platform and creating structures, such as uh, the governance forum we mentioned, we have the civil society platform, we have the tax force that bring both UN and non-UN entities together to support different communities. Now, when it comes to the big question around the, the civil military cooperation, I think one of the key mandates that's identified on the strategy is the member state directed the, the Electoral Business Commission to establish what it called the Civil Military Cooperation Cell. And that is in recognition of the gap that exists between the relationship between the security actors in the region and humanitarian actors on the one side. But also what Anwar mentioned, the gap that exists between the security actors and communities. If you talk about the gap that exists between security actors and communities, there's this lack of trust in terms of, from the military point of view, when it started, they don't know who is Boko Haram because uh, in a community that way it is happening, there's skepticism in terms of who this young man we are seeing is, is he a member or not? So there's a lot of uh, uh, complaints from community that innocent people were being branded as Boko Haram, but you can understand the military side of things. But also on the humanitarian side, um, you have, issues around states' uh, responsibility to protect its entire territory. And you have the humanitarian principles that guide humanitarian operation. I think there are a few sticking points when you talk about the humanitarian, uh, some limited humanitarian peculiarities in the region. And I'm just gonna highlight, highlight a few. 
One is the understanding or the varied understanding between the military and the humanitarian in terms of their mandate. And let me come from an example, having, from instance, having spoken to different groups. The military, for example, feels that uh, there are four parties to the conflict, and they include Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. And every other party, including Boko Haram, they are a group of terrorists that the, the countries are trying to defeat. Now, from the humanitarian point of view, humanitarian feels that, that the Boko Haram groups are a party to the conflict. This conceptual clarity is where there is a gap in terms of how the military and humanitarian engage. And this is why you will see in the region where government would give the humanitarian actors red lines of areas you can get to and areas you cannot get to. The other aspect you need to consider is that some of these countries, depending on how you define democracy and how you look at democracy, feel that they're all democratic institutions that they have been elected. And because of that, they have power over the entire territory and they are not willing to give up an entire territory uh, 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 to any group. So this is also one of the things that also look at, we should have to look at. The third factor, which I think we covered in the, in the article you mentioned is, there's an emergence of humanitarian, state humanitarian agencies in the four countries. And they are emerging, Nigeria has now a Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Cameroon is coming up with one, Chad and Niger. And they are seeing themselves now having that responsibility to provide that humanitarian services. So, and that has supposed to be to ask the question, what is going to become the future of humanitarianism if the, these humanitarian agencies uh, become developed and but also become political? So there's a huge question mark around that. If there's going to be impartiality, if they become very political. And I think we have to look at that. The other aspect that I think um, we highlighted uh, but I think also in the practicalities is the relationship between the security and communities. Over the years, there's a very, very high mistrust between the communities and security actors. Because one a good example when we're engaging with the communities was that the communities made, uh, you know, told us that if they know someone that is a member of Boko Haram and they report it to the police or to the army, they are likely going to be arrested and branded member of Boko Haram. So because of that, the, there's no trust in terms of information sharing and intelligence gathering between the community and the military. And what has been able to happen is through the civil military cooperation cell, we have helped the MNJTF within the secretariat where we work to establish committee dialogue where the committee will be able to explain to the militaries their issues, their grievances, and they come to, together to agree ways of strengthening relationship. And we have accompanied that political di um, uh, committee dialogue by engaging with gatekeepers in the various communities, identifying trusted gatekeepers that committees could trust to share information with. Because you have to recognize that if the Boko Haram factions identify and know that you're sharing information with the military, your life is also at risk. You might be other. So that information protocol, if you, if, you, if, you, if you may, has to be protected, has to be managed. And that trust between the military and the community has to be reestablished. And that is the, one of the focus of the LCBC MNJTF Civil Military Cooperation Cell. But also, finally, to conclude, also to begin to engage with the MNJTF and create a platform to find a middle ground through interaction between the MNJTF and humanitarian actors for them to understand each other and find a way of working closely in terms of ensuring that there's humanitarian access to the different area that humanitarian access needs to go. But also for them to understand their role in protecting civilians, their role in ensuring that uh, uh, reduction in gender-based violence, but particularly the road in protecting women and girls in conflict situation. So I will hand over to you and I'll end there for now, Anwar. Well, thank you for the, for, for, the, for the insights here. That's a critical element here. 
I mean, these peculiarities and the, partic the, the practicalities of civil military engagements in the Lake Chad Basin, but but also, you know, in in other in other theaters here. Uh, so so thank you for for the uh, for the highlights. Also on the on the regional strategy for stabilization, recovery, and resilience, and and he talked about the instruments and resources that go beyond. Uh, uh, just military operations and, and that go beyond the borders here, right? So the idea is how do you promote this cross-border cooperation on security, on stabilization, early recovery, development, uh, rehabilitation, and, um, and, 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 and reintegration. So, so thank you to, to, uh, to the three of you really for, uh, for excellent insights. Uh, from your work uh, uh, that uh, that I highly uh, um, you know appreciate that I use uh, in my work as well. But thank you for your insights on these on these critical topics. Uh, and thank you to the participants also for following our conversation. Uh, I hope you found it uh, useful. I I, um, I sure did. So now we will move to the uh, Q and A session. So we can start with uh, uh, with these two general questions here. Uh, one is the, you know, again, the harpers on the, the lessons learned here uh, from, from, from looking at combat and violent extremism in the Lake Chad Basin. And I think three of you did a fantastic job there. But then how can these lessons be applied in other regions, you know, affected by uh, by this uh, by this threat uh, and this was a question asked in in Portuguese uh, and then similar related question really again it's what what sound and sustainable uh, counterterrorism strategy should be uh, in place to deal I mean with this problem here which is as we all know widening uh, its scope you know, in, uh, in, 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 in Africa on the wreck. So let's, let's open the, the floor here. And uh, Vincent, do you want to take a shot? At this? Yes, yes. All certainly. right. I mean, thank you. Uh, there are a few I mean, very simple lessons that, mm -hmm. that you can learn if you look at the, at the way things have been going in Nigeria. First of all is uh, tell no lies, make no claims. Uh, just say things as they are, because you know the the environment in Nigeria, um, the trust of citizens, uh, the cooperation with international partners, has really been seriously degraded by the amount of conspiracy theorizing that has been circulating, uh, including by by state elites. Um, there is a tendency to to deny to say, oh, it's just bandits, it's nothing. Uh, a tendency to say, oh, no, there's no global jihadi involvement. I mean, you know, oh, we're winning this and so on. I mean, this creates a serious trust problem for both citizens and international partners. And, and really, just, just say things like they are. And, and if you don't know, just say you don't know. Because you're going to, to create a very um, degraded conversation in which nobody knows what and, and you know, imaginations go crazy. Uh, and it's just making things more complicated. So that, this is sort of very basic lesson. Um, another lesson is, so I did, I did my prior research in, uh, in, in Casanos in Southern Senegal, uh, where the Senegalese state has been facing a separatist insurgency for a number of years. Um, one thing they did uh, in the early days is they, they, the Senegalese forces, uh, well, the gendarmerie captured uh, um, the key leaders of the movement very early on. And they did not kill them. They were judged. They were eventually released. And at least one of them, uh, a Catholic priest, actually became a sort of facilitator later on. You know, when when and when the region was exhausted with the fighting, then the Father Diamakun became a sort of moderating voice. I can't help thinking uh, how different it would be uh, if Mohammed Yusuf, the founder of Boko Haram, had not been killed by the Nigerian police in in 2009. Um, a, after his arrest, after the army actually gave him over to the police. And we know why it happened. You know, they, they had attacked the police at the barracks in Borno. They had killed lots of policemen. You know, people were furious. But if Mohammed Yusuf was still alive today, where would we be? I wonder. So, you know, that's, and, and maybe tacking to a sort of broader point is 
counterinsurgency, uh, I mean, killing your way through counterinsurgency is very difficult. I mean, you, you could say Chechnya worked, uh, even though Chechnya created lots of problems because you've got all those Chechen fighters, um, you know, going elsewhere and fighting on other fronts. But it's a very difficult one to, to get away with. Um, it, takes, uh, it takes Russia against Chechnya, so a massive uh, state and army against a very tiny uh, country. Um, and, and so, you know, getting human rights better, I think, is, is essential because you need the population to trust um, a counterinsurgent state. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And then maybe my broader point. I mean, this is all about competitive statehood. And if you if you listen to people, you know, farmers, fishermen, traders who engage with ISWAP on the ground, what they say essentially is we don't like them, but we trust them. They are dependable. We know we won't be killed if we go to them. Uh, we know um, there are courts that we can go to that are cheap and we can get redress, including against their own fighters. That's you know, that's big, you know, can Nigeria provide that? Can Chad provide that? Can, you know, can the four Lake Chad state provide the same sort of, it's, it's very basic statehood, it's very cheap and, and people miss the, you know, the, the access to large markets and, you know, they, there's some stuff they, they miss, but they see that living under a swap is, you know, it's okay, at least we can live. And then finally tying to a point that uh, Tenny was making, um, ISWAP is making loans, you know, small small loans, uh, credit, um, free of free of interest because you know they are they claim to act uh, according to current law, so there's no interest. Um, and not only to their fighters, but also to civilians. So if you come to them uh, and you say, "Well, I need money," it has to be for you know business, so trade or um, you know, farming and so on. But if you come to them and ask for, for money, I've heard several people who've received loan from them. <laughs> That's again, you know, competitive statehood. Not not fantastic, but competitive. Excellent. Thank you. Tiniela? Yes, I want to add a quick point to this. Sure. So one thing that um again I'd like to draw our attention to is the underlying factors of the conflict. So with Nigeria, for a long time, Boko Haram was, was the gaming town in terms of insecurity, and all of the focus was on the Lake Chad Basin and those regions that were affected. But then because there were similar underlying factors, even across other parts of the North, we saw an emergence of another crisis. It had been there before, but then it got worse, which is now the bandits um, issue. Or, I mean, now the government refers to them as terrorists. And now they're even deadlier than Boko Haram in many ways. So they're killing more people and displacing more people. So never ignoring the underlying factors is very important because even if you try to militarily address a conflict in one space, it can emerge in another space as long as those factors still exist. So just to add to what uh, Vincent has said. Absolutely. Thank you. I don't know, Chica, whether you want to add anything here, Brian. Yeah, I think uh, four key lessons I think that is important to highlight from my point of view. I, think mm -hmm. I don't want to dwell on what uh, Vincent and uh, Tenera has mentioned. One is that I agree with Vincent that accountability for actions and resources is a very, very important lesson that we have to learn. Um, accountability in terms of the various actors, our actions has to be, we have to be accountable for our actions, both in terms of human rights actions, but, it, but also in terms of how resources have been used. I think it's very, very important. The second uh, point is also, we are not going to be able to shoot our way out of this conflict by killing everybody. Uh, Wilson mentioned, and I can confirm that, ISWAP is winning hearts and minds. We have to win hearts and minds to be able to win this conflict. And winning heart and minds means that there has to be a building of trust between communities and the state. And that means that the state has to become much more accountable to the communities. The second, the third point is about um, ownership of the process of trying to rebuild these areas. We mentioned about the ownership we see in the Lake Basin, but the other ownership has to translate in terms of also the, the, the the business of usual of the project approach that you see in different 
uh, countries is not going to cut it in the Lake Chad Basin. And I'm saying it from, out, from experience uh, of what I have seen and what we have done and why we've been able to use the small resources to achieve results is because the stabilization initiative in Lake Chad Basin is anchored at the level of the governor's offices of each of the territories. They lead this process. It is part of that development plan. It's not a project of the UNDP or a project of, of UN entities. It's a project, a program of the government mm. with the support from the UN. So it has is important. And then finally, political leadership. We couldn't, we cannot stand off and wish that the conflict is going to end. It has to be, has to be strong political leadership for this conflict to end. So I think these are the four key lessons I think is important for us to underline uh, here. Well, thank you. Very, very relevant, obviously, to uh, to other theaters, to all theaters. Um, so let's do a, a last round of, of of questions, and then we can uh, then we can conclude. Two questions deal with the uh, uh, integration. So one question was straightforward. Are there any negotiations between the four states, the Lake Chad Basin and Boko Haram? So that we know if that, you know, it's ongoing or, uh, and also what's the best way of dealing with the returnees here? I mean, those young people, and this is a question I'm quoting, who joined the violent groups and then when their expectations are not uh, met, um so you know they leave and want to be integrated into society here but in some spaces society is unable to take them back and and and, and sometimes they're targeted for uh, uh you know neutralization or elimination uh so so that uh, uh another question is on the mnjtf here so what analysis can you make of those actions and to be fair chica do well do well on that uh, and then one was on the local action plans. So, um, so in view of the Lake Chad Basin, you know, commission uh, and all those strategies. So, have local action plans for preventing violent extremism uh, being drawn up at the level of the various communities here to prevent and and fight against uh, uh, against violent extremism. So. Yeah, I can uh, start with we go to Chica, to Niola, uh, Vincent, and and we and we'll end up there. So and just be be brief if you don't mind in, in your remarks. We only have four minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Let, I don't, thank I don't, you. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if the person was <laughs> okay. Quickly, um, I will touch on first question on mm -hmm. um, straightforward one. Has local action plan been drawn? Yes, we call them the territorial action plan. It's accessible. The person can reach out to us. It's not confidential document. We can share that. Let's get that question out of the way. The, the second question I think I need to talk on, touch on is best way to deal with returnees. Uh, as at today, we have around 80,000 plus people that have returned since May 2021. And before that, there's Operation Safe Corridor in Nigeria, there's Gudu Maria in, in Niger. However, there are a lot of things, a lot of gaps that exist. I think that a few things we need to do to get them right. And well, because they wouldn't have time, I think to be short, brief, and straight to the point. One, we need to have a clear process of screening. Why is this important? Most people you see that are coming out, all of them are not Boko Haram. Some people are victims. Some people are children that are victims. Some people are women that are victims. Some people are young people that are victims. We need to be able to screen and categorize different people. The second thing we need to do, we need to have a clear prosecutorial strategies. How do we prosecute each of the people? The third thing that, that we need to do is that we need to look at having categorized and have a clear strategy. How do, where does they belong in terms of rehabilitation? Is it going to be prison-based rehabilitation? Is it different to, uh, pathways for rehabilitation? The fourth thing is, how do we get community involved? If you rehabilitate them as state and you send them back to the community, they'll be stigmatized. So it has to be community-based. Community has to be prepared. Government need to work with the communities. So, and the final point I need to mention, I'm not saying this is exhaustive, is that how do we ensure you do not create a new problem? And I would give a quick example. In 2019, I had a workshop and we're dealing with issues talking about issues of reintegration. And the woman from Bifa stood up and said, do not create a new problem for us. 
if you begin to rehabilitate ex associates without paying attention to the young people that are in the community, you give the young people an impression that the best way to get attention from international community is to become a member of Boko Haram. How do you ensure that you balance both? So that, and what they started doing in Niger defies, if they are going to rehabilitate one ex associate, they're going to help four young people in the community. So community has seen there's a, a motivation for people to, young people to keep doing good rather than trying to go and join Boko Haram. So I identified these four key areas. I'm sure that others will have other point. On the final, in terms of MNJTF, I'm not really sure I understand the question about MNJTF. Uh, uh, I'm not clear about the question. You already touched on it, really. I mean, it's just to clarify some of the actions, how effective, not effective. But given the, the time constraint, I mean, if you want to take yeah. 30 minutes max, but but otherwise, I think you, you're yeah. not working. Yeah, I think uh, 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 what I can say is that over the past two, eight, 12 to 18 months, there's been a yeah. lot of improvement mm. in actions of the MNJTF. Trust has improved because the trust you see, I just used to say trust has improved tremendously. And I say yes, because over the past 18 months, there's been a lot of effort in community engagement. So the actions of MNJTF has improved. There's been a lot of capacity building for MNJTF. But Anwar, you can share my contact with you know, uh, participants, they can reach us, they can reach me directly. We can have bilateral conversation. I can share materials with them and they can, they can, we can discuss more. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's exactly what, what, uh, what we want and what we need. Thank you. Uh, Tenyoma, any you question to, really? To, um, add to what Chika has said for integration, I think, um, one of the gaps I have noticed is the messaging. So in Nigeria, for example, there's this idea that, Boko Haram associates or former Boko Haram associates that you know committed a lot of violence are being reintegrated into communities. And like Chika mm -hmm. has alluded to, there's a screening process. Yeah. And this means that usually the ones that are being reintegrated are not the ones that are known to have committed um, these crimes. And mm -hmm. people do not know this. You know, in Nigerian popular culture, they think that you're taking killers in quotes back into communities. So I think to make it clear what some of these processes are, to make it clear that those that have been reintegrated, Chika mentioned 80,000 people, most of these people were not fighters. They were just people that found themselves living within Boko Haram territory. And making it clear that you know these were just associates, you know, they were not all combatants in that sense may help um, with the reintegration process. Also, there's the issue of women because women are not often dealt in the same ways as men in the reintegration process. The screening is not as detailed. So you have an issue where we know that women play different roles in the conflict. Not all of them were victims. Some of them were actually agents or agentic in the conflict. So you can have an issue of radicalization even within um, settlement camps where when you lump women that were victims or non-violent and those that were more agentic and then there can be some communication or messaging going on there. And then I just wanted to also mention that even about beyond thinking about the integration of former associates, there's still the issue of IDPs and their resettlement. So that's even um, one of the big priorities and the issue of livelihoods, whether it's IDPs or whether it's former Boko Haram associates, you can't just push them back into whatever spaces that they were before. How can they you know, develop sustainable livelihoods that means that um, they have options beyond, you know, sometimes like has happened, finding their ways back into um, these violent extremist groups. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vincent? Maybe just, just to add on this question of uh, how, how to handle the reintegration. I think it takes time. Um, the, when the conversation <laughs> began about that in 2017, there was really an uproar in Nigeria. 2016, actually, the first woman coming back from Boko Haram. It created mm -hmm. a lot of tension in Maiduguri. But then, you know, as time went by, people saw that, oh, yeah, there are those women. Five years down the line, nobody fears anymore or worries anymore about women coming back from Boko Haram areas. And now we've reached a situation where actually actual fighters have been released. I mean, I know cases. I've interviewed fighters who've been released into communities. Um, and they're kind of okay. I mean, the ones who've done really bad stuff in their original communities, they know. And they know that they must stay away. But the ones who, who know they can go back, it's usually okay. I haven't heard a lot of stories about uh, those people returning and getting into trouble, actually. Uh, so, you know, it takes time. It's a conversation that needs to begin at some point and, you know, you, you can't rush it. Uh, and then over time, when people are tired enough, because I think this is what it is, you know, people are tired and they want, to, they want it to stop and they're willing to cut deals. It's not great. It's not, you know, it's not wonderful, but it's what it is. Um, on, on the FMM, on the uh, MNGDF, well, I mean, 
to be frank, uh, ISWAP developed on the Lake Chad, uh, you know, like on the islands and so on, which was precisely the area that the MNGTF was supposed to cover. And this is where uh, ISWAP took off, basically, uh, the new rationalized ISWAP. So in this sense, you could say uh, that the MNGTF failed uh, to stop the development of, 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 of ISWAP there. Uh, but it's already something, you know, it's at least there is cooperation. Uh, you, you've seen uh, Chadian troops, Cameroonian troops entering into Nigeria. You've seen, you know, mutual support. You've seen, and, and this is part of the solution, of course, you know, and, and, and curbing uh, illegal um, circulations of goods and so on. So, you know, this is part of, of what, so it's, we, we are far from there um, regarding the MHDF. But you know, it's 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 already a very big step. Remember, those countries really were not friends uh, twenty years ago. Uh, and then on negotiations, there has been an attempt uh, when Mama Noor was influent in uh, in ISWAP. Uh, it ended with uh, Mama Noor being executed, uh, and and so there are some conversations, but they are mostly about hostage liberations. Um, I I'm not seeing so. Okay, because JAS is in such a difficult situation, uh, maybe some people in JAS uh, might take uh, a deal. Uh, some have, you know, sort of smaller commanders. There's a Sulhu program in Nigeria that does that, um, trying to bring out com commanders. But at the top level, I think it's going to be very difficult. Okay, uh, excellent. I think that would, that brings us to the to the end of, of this conversation. Uh, and all of you have emphasized that in certain uh, uh, critical elements, winning hearts and minds, obviously states have to become more accountable. Uh, we need more increased protection. Uh, uh, communities need more increased protection against armed group. And that's crucial to restore livelihoods, uh, to improve in resilience. And this includes, as you have mentioned, and, and you, uh, the three of you wrote about, you know, how do you protect transport routes? How do you improve security and markets and borders? And, and obviously, this is the responsibility of, of governments uh, and also the multinational uh, task force. Behavior such as, you know, extortion, harassment of, uh, of communities, uh, that's counterproductive to say the least, needs to be penalized. Um, taxes and other arbitrary charges levied against economic actors should be reduced here. So we need to, you know, more work needs to be done. And, and, and here, as Charles laid out, you know, the like Chad Commission and other actors, they are supporting governments and affected local communities to strengthen that social contract, you know, uh, to try to reestablish really trust, you know, between security actors, communities, states, you know, communities, uh, law and order. Uh, so uh, and uh, and 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 uh, and uh, you know, some of the initiatives have improved, uh, you know, the security conditions for affected communities. They have improved the. Uh, enhanced access to to livelihood options so so obviously more needs to be to be done there but thank you uh all for your participation uh in this uh, webinar and, and thank you to our brilliant uh, panelists you know for their contributions uh, and most importantly for taking the time to come and uh, and speak uh, to us and and to our community of uh, of interest. So please uh, consider joining us for subsequent uh, webinars. So stay safe and stay well. Thank you.